So, uh, shall we pray? Holy Spirit of God, we would thank you for the light and the life that you've given us during these past nine months and these evening services. We know that those to whom much is given, much will be required, and we realize that we have no alternative but to walk in that light and walk into the life that you have for us. So we thank you, Holy Spirit, for all the light. And now we commit ourselves to getting our lives up to date with that light, to walking in all of it, because we know that it's only if we walk in the, in the light as he is in the light that we'll have fellowship one with another and that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin. We thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Loved ones, we're talking tonight about the process experience of the cross. And you remember that last Sunday evening, we talked of the crisis experience of the cross. And it's very easy, really, to make the distinction between them. Because the crisis experience of the cross concerns primarily our wills, and indeed especially our selfish will, and the process experience of the cross concerns our independent souls, which really are our minds and emotions. And just to emphasize that for those of you who, to whom those terms are a little new, I would remind you that the New Testament outlines the psychology of our personalities in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, where the words run, may uh, God sanctify you wholly, and may he preserve your spirit and soul and body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And then if you trace spirit through the Old and New Testaments and soul through the Old and New Testaments and body through the Old and New Testaments, you begin to see that the spirit is that part of us that communicates with God directly. It's within us. And it is the power whereby we have communion with God. It's the power whereby we know by intuition what God wants us to do. And it's also the power of judging whether what we're doing is what God has told us to do or not through the conscience. And then the soul is the psychological part of us, and you get that indeed from the Greek word for soul, which is suke, suke logos, becomes psychological. And it's the psychological part of us, the mind and the emotions and the will. That's what a psychologist or a psychiatrist who isn't a Christian deals with. And then the body, you can see yourselves. And uh, the beauty of our position is that God intended to use us to pass his spirit into his world. That's why we're here on earth. God made the world, and then he was going to use us to touch the world with his spirit. That's why you're here. You're here to touch the world with the spirit of Jesus. And if you don't touch the world with Jesus' spirit, really, the world will not be touched by him. It's a little like that myth, you remember, that was told of Jesus returning to heaven. And uh, the angel, Gabriel, asked him what arrangement he had made for the earth. And he said that he had taught 12 men all the things that his father had shown him, and he would depend on those 12 men to pass that on to the world. And Gabriel said, uh, what if they fail? And Jesus said, I have made no other arrangements. Now, even though that is a myth, yet it gets over the powerful importance of you to God. You are sent here to touch the world with God's Spirit. And so the Father's plan was that our personalities would work like that. 
actually as transmitters. His Spirit would come into us through our spirits, would be passed on through our souls and out to the world. That was God's plan. And in doing that, we would receive all that we needed, all the security we needed. He would meet all our needs from his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He would provide all the food, shelter, and clothing we needed. He would give us all the sense of importance we needed because we'd immediately sense we were in the center of God's plan for his world. So we'd have a great sense of worth and value. We'd never have any problem with identity, what we were here to do. We'd have a great sense of being co-workers with the creator of the whole universe. And of course, we'd have a great sense of happiness and joy and just walking with him day by day. That was God's plan. And what we did was rebel against it, you remember, and become receivers. Receivers from the world. We started to try to get from the world the happiness and the security and the significance that God intended us to receive from him. And so that is the problem. And actually, loved ones, what God has done in Jesus is to put the receivers into Christ and to destroy them and to recreate them as transmitters. And when we talk about the crisis experience of the cross, we're talking about the fact that most of us are not willing to become transmitters. Many of us enter into some sense of our forgiveness with God, but we are not ready to become transmitters of His Spirit. We still enjoy the significance and the security and the happiness that we receive from other people and from the world. And so the heart of the crisis experience is we're saying to God, I'm willing to be a transmitter. Now, if I could just emphasize the importance of that again. Do you see how many of us go home tonight or go to our rooms or meet our roommates and we expect things from them? We expect things from them. That's why when the room is untidy, we get irritable. Because we expect that room to be tidy. You know there's a response within us even when I share that, because you say, well, of course I do. Isn't it normal and natural? Well, wasn't it normal and natural for the Son of God when he came to earth to be crowned king and to be welcomed and to be exalted? It wasn't natural for him to be crucified as a criminal. And yet what God is saying to us is, I want you to cease to be a receiver and to commit your life forever to being a transmitter of my spirit to others, to expecting nothing from anybody. See, that's all our problem. You know that. Tomorrow morning, we get into the car and we expect immediately. And we are pretty irritated when that thing does not start. And we're always expecting this to happen and expecting that to happen. And it isn't too bad when we expect machines to work. The unfortunate thing is we begin to treat the people that we meet through tomorrow as machines and we expect them to give us things. And so we're constantly acting as receivers. Now, it is quite a decision in a Christian's life or in anyone's life to decide no longer to receive and forever from this day forward to transmit. Now, that's what we call being delivered from carnality. Carnality is from the Greek word sarkakos, and it means fleshly. And it means we get everything we need through our bodies. And we get it through our bodies from other people. And we're always expecting to get happiness from the warm sunshine and the bright light. We're expecting to get happiness from the feel of the water on our bodies. We're expecting to get happiness from other people loving us and appreciating us. We're expecting to get happiness from the things we see. We're expecting to get a good feeling inside from the things we eat. And dying to that is being delivered from carnality. That's being willing never to receive from the world again, to have the world crucified to you, to act as if you're a dead person who receives only from God. And so it's ceasing to be a receiver and being forever after a transmitter. Now that's what we talked about last day. 
And that's what we talk, talk about when we discuss Romans 6 and 6. That's the crisis experience of the cross. We know that our old self was crucified with Christ so that the sinful body, the body of sin, might be left unemployed so, because it didn't need any longer to get from the world. And we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Sin is living independent of God, getting security, significance, and happiness from other people and other things except, besides God. And being crucified with Christ is entering into that. And the way you do it is by believing that you were crucified with Christ and then by submitting to the Holy Spirit, by putting to death through the Spirit the deeds of the body, by for in, forever after obeying the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means, loved ones. Ceasing to be a receiver and committing yourself forever to becoming a transmitter. And that is a glorious moment of freedom. And that is life eternal, when we cease to receive or want to receive from other people. And that is a work of the cross, the crisis experience of the cross. Now, loved ones, here's what happens after we do that. Suddenly we find that we are no longer living like that. We're no longer living like this. We're no longer living inwardly from other people and from the world. We're beginning to live outwardly. But there are two problems. One, the soul is used to passing through to the spirit all that it receives from the world. So one great need is that the soul would be divided from the spirit. And that's what is discussed, you remember, in Hebrews 4 and 12. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, we're used to getting some kind of sense of significance in our emotions from the way people treat us. And we pass that on through. But if they reject us, we pass that on through too. And that's why we get depressed so quickly. That's why we go up and down so readily. When somebody smiles at us and says something nice to us, then we're on cloud seven. But somebody doesn't speak to us nicely or doesn't even look at us, and we're cast down. So we're utterly at the mercy of the way people treat us. That's why it's essential if we're going to begin to move outwardly and be a transmitter as God intended us to be, it's vital for the spirit to be divided from the soul so that it no longer passes things through immediately as it has done up to then. Another problem is because the soul has been the servant of the body here, it has worked in ways that are perverted. And so there are strong soulish powers that have to be broken. And that is what is talked about, you remember, in I think it's 2 Corinthians 4 and 12, where God's Word says, we bear in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. In other words, our minds, for instance, were meant to understand what God gave to us in our spirits and to express it to other people. But once our minds became dominated by the world and by people, our minds began to manipulate. That's all you can do, you see. If you have no power to bring the world and its events under the control of God, then what you end up doing is manipulating. So you understand that much of our psychology and much of our medicine is actually manipulating one power against another. That's often the difficulties in the whole drug scene in medicine that uh, you do one thing with a drug, but it has all kinds of other side effects. Because actually what you're doing is manipulating the natural powers against one another. You can hardly be said to be healing anything. You're actually just using one power to hold another power back. And that's why medicine and psychology, apart from God's spirit, is often a temporary cure. It is rarely a complete and perfect cure. Because it's a, the mind manipulating. The mind was actually meant to understand what God's Spirit wanted us to do and to express that to the world. But now the mind manipulates. So you have soulish powers that have to be broken. So here you have to have a, divi a division between soul and spirit. And here you have soulish powers that have to be broken. 
Because when you were a receiver, you would go into the office and there would be a battle on between two people. And you had no guidance from God as to what to do. Indeed, you had no spirit of wanting to do anything in that sense. All you wanted was peace in the office. So you got used to manipulating one person against another or playing off one against another or playing off a compromise between the two. Now, your mind is used to running like that. It's used to manipulating. It just comes naturally to it. Now, what you find even after you've accepted your crucifixion with Christ and agreed no longer to live from the outside in, you find that this dear old soul still operates like a receiver. And it still has mighty and strong powers that continue to operate as if they were living off the world. And so those powers have to be broken. Otherwise, when you begin to try to do God's work, you'll find your mind manipulating in the same way. And of course, that doesn't transmit Jesus' life to people. We all know that through many of the less respectable methods that are used in evangelism at times. Uh, all of us know here who are young at all, we know that we are very quick to suspect when it's a kind of a, a, a we give you something if you give us something. And when you face that kind of evangelistic strategy, it, it, the life of Jesus doesn't come over to you. In fact, you are rather put off by it. And it's because loved ones are trying to do God's work, but they're trying to do it with powers of soul that are still operating the way they operated before Jesus' spirit came in and transformed their lives. And it's the so with emotions. You find that. The emotions were meant you see, to express the joy that comes from our fellowship with God. The emotions were meant to give joy to other people. Now, when we turn from God and turn to the world, we had to get joy from other people. We had to get happiness. So the emotions are used to getting joy. And of course, that's what has perverted a great deal of Christianity here in the States, isn't it? It's a get joy kind of religion. Indeed, you're, it's almost accepted that you encourage loved ones to receive Jesus because it will give them joy. You'll be happy. And then the tragedy is that you have to keep having happier and happier meetings. And you have to keep giving people more and more joy to justify your first invitation to them. And so a great deal of Christendom runs with a soulish power that has never been broken. And it is concerned primarily with getting joy. Uh, you know that. You, you and I know it. Uh, most of the invitations that we get to services or meetings are based on that, aren't they? Come and hear Cardi Ten Boom. You'll really enjoy it. I know we use the word a little loosely, but at heart, the, we really mean you'll get something from this. We, we certainly don't say to many people, Come and hear Corrie Ten Boom and contribute to the praise of God that will be taking place in that meeting and contribute with your love to the ministry of Jesus' life that will be going out to others who need to receive life through her. But we rarely make that kind of presentation. We usually make the kind of presentation, you'll enjoy this. It's a good crowd. You'll feel at home. You'll like it. Try it. You'll like it. That's our usual approach, and it's based on soulish powers that are not broken of their old ways at all. They're still operating in the old system, and it's so with the will, loved ones. The will is meant to be ruled by the Spirit, and then it's meant, you see, to rule the mind and emotions. That's the way it's meant to work. The Spirit is meant to rule our wills, and then the will will rule the mind and emotions. i show you it maybe a little more clearly on this. That's, that's the way God intends things to work. The conscience will govern, constrain the will, and the will will direct the mind and emotions. But in fact, of course, what has happened is the will has become utterly dominated by the mind and emotions. And so many loved ones who accept, Lord, I'm willing no longer to receive anything from my wife, from people that I need to get from you. I'm willing to live outward for the rest of my life, to give love, 
to give joy, to give happiness, to give peace, not to be a receiver of peace, but to receive what I need from you and to give to other people. We say that, but our will is so long been dominated, has so long been dominated by our mind and emotions that it is not used to exercising an executive role in the personality. Isn't that why so many of us have problems with wandering thoughts and prayer? I mean, it is really interesting. We have a, a, an incredibly lackadaisical attitude towards wandering thoughts, you know. We, it's silly even to talk about wandering thoughts. Thoughts wander because you let them wander. But don't we often bring that up? Well, I have a great problem with wandering thoughts. And I know many of you loved ones have asked me, what do you do with wandering thoughts? And the feeling is that something has to be done with them. Well, actually, what has to be done with them is you exercise your will and you bring them under captivity to Christ Jesus. But we've, so, we've got so used to the will being dominated by our mind or emotions rather than exercising control of our mind and emotions that we can't possibly think that we ought to do it. I think that's why many of us have trouble unnecessary trouble with temptations. We really have been freed from self, and we've been freed from a desire to be tempted. But we've got so used to letting Satan insert any thought into our minds at any time, and then to think that we have not the power to chuck those thoughts out. We somehow think, oh, they're in, they're in. Boy, we'd better let them stay. And we don't realize that the will has absolute control over the mind. The mind can stop thinking this moment. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, psalm, zeta, eta, the Greek alphabet. You can say it this moment. You can decide what you're going to think about. You can decide this moment. You think, think black. You think black. There, black. Monday, think Monday. Monday, I think Monday. You have actually power to control your thought life. But we're so used to being dominated by our minds and emotions, that our wills have grown weak. And that's the problem, loved ones, that has to be settled. There are two great needs in connection with the process experience of the cross, and they concern the part of our souls. The spirit has to be divided from the soul, and the parts of the soul have to be broken that are operating in the wrong way so that they can come under the control of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God seeks to do with the process experience of the cross. And that is mentioned in several places, but maybe you would like to look at Luke, and it's chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And it's verse 23. Luke 9 and 23. And he said to all, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now that's the daily cross. That's the process experience of the cross. Verse 24. For whoever would save his life and the Greek word you remember is the word for soul. It's P-S-U-C-H-E, suke or psyche. For whoever would save his soul will lose it. So if you allow yourself to be dominated by your soul the way it's operating at present, you'll lose your soul. And you notice that's what happens. That's why Alberto V05 and Try It, You'll Like It, and every commercial works because you, we all become dominated by society and by the thoughts and suggestions that are fed into society. And you'll notice that when people try to work by the power of their own souls, their souls come under the domination of all the other souls and all the other advertising and commercials that are put over to them, and so we all become the same. We all drive the same cars. We all have the same haircuts. We all grow beards together. We all wear jeans together. Really, you lose. It's interesting. In order, trying to save your individuality or save your soul, you actually lose it. Whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. And so that's the process experience of the cross. And it involves two sides then, the division between soul and spirit which is brought about by the Word of God coming to us and re re revealing to us that our spirit and soul is not broken. 
and then through the breaking experiences that God brings us into. And you find that in 2 Corinthians, if you like to look at it. 2 Corinthians 4, and it's verse 10. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For while we are live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. My loved ones, I could give just a few illustrations that might help to clarify the distinction between these two. You remember that Peter denied Jesus to the little maid. And uh, it isn't hard for any of us to see why he did it. He was afraid. He was afraid for his own life. Because they were all round him and saying, you're one of the Nazarenes. And he thought that would mean he would go straight to the cross after Jesus. So that was self. That was carnality. The denial was carnality. It was fear of self. It was the selfish will rebelling. It was a rebellion. You remember Jesus cut off the ear of the high priest's servant in Gethsemane. Do you see that that was a, a different kind of deed? It was wrong still. Jesus, you remember, then took the ear and healed the man immediately uh, and told Peter and the others to put up their swords. So it was wrong, but it was a different kind of deed. It was done with an open heart, with no thought of self, only to defend his Lord. So he wanted his Lord's glory with all his heart. But he was doing it in the wrong way. And the uh, cutting off of the ear of the servant it was a soulish act and it was a result of deception. It was still wrong, but it was, in a sense, unconscious sin. He was doing something that he thought was right, but it was wrong. But he was doing it with the best heart in the world. Now, that is one distinction between rebellion and deception. If you would suffer my old illustration that I've given before, I could tell you a little one with me. Um, I was, oh, oh, you know the story that uh, a husband is proud of what his wife is and a wife is proud of what her husband does. I don't know that it's right, but it, it's... It, it says something about our relationship in society. Anyway, we men love to achieve things. We love to think that we're going to do something and make our niche in, in the world and have our niche in the Hall of Fame. And I was, like the rest of us, filled with selfish ambition and a desire to be someone and to be important and to achieve something always for God. We're always very generous about that side of it. But we always want to achieve something. We never want to be laid aside. We never want to be willing to be laid aside. And so I would read biographies of great Christians. And as I was reading, I would very casually, because I was interested in becoming important too and famous and worthwhile, I would very casually uh, tot up where John Wesley was when God started to use him. And then I would tot up where I was in age, and how many years had I left to really make it. <laughs> now, the fault and the problem was just a gross egotistical self that had to be crucified. And there was no freedom in my life until I at last accepted, Lord, I'm willing to be nothing for you, willing to be a failure, willing to be nothing, willing to be regarded by no one as long as you love me. That's the only thing that matters. And God freed me from that carnality. Then one day, I was reading a biography of Finney, I think, and I was just reading it casually. And here I find my mind doing a little mathematics. And I couldn't, why was I subtracting as 